Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. Uh, my name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, again, I like looking at data. Uh, I try looking at the big picture view. And what we're doing here today is I found some articles, I found some charts of really long US 10-year treasury yields since 1790. And then I looked at even longer charts, uh, short-term rates and long-term rates uh, for the past 5,000 years. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for patterns. I'm looking for things that could potentially break out and maybe explanations of why some things broke out um, and, and looking at the charting. Uh, I know a lot of channels, I don't think they really look at this stuff from this long-term view, but I, I, I'm really interested to see uh, what's going on here. So let, let's dive in here, um, look at some of these really long-term charts of, of yields, uh, inflation yields, and then I also look at, uh, so I look at yields, big long-term yields, and I look at long-term inflation, and I also compare it to a long-term chart of housing starts, which I found. Pretty sweet stuff. And I, and I, I go into some scenarios of an article that I thought uh, were pretty cool, and, and, and I thought they correctly identified some stuff. So we'll go over that as well uh, in this clip. And an energy crisis did happen in the 70s, and I think energy crisis is happening worldwide today. So I'm kind of looking at it from that paradigm as well. Uh, usually energy, higher energy costs, it usually leads to higher uh, costs. And if this is deep enough and has a big enough problem, we could see shortages and, and whatnot of, of certain items, which could be pretty profound depending on what those items are uh, and how costly some of these things can get. And I don't, I don't even think about cost anymore. It's more about like, what if we have certain shortages like food shortages? And what is the ramifications going to happen if we have that? So I'll just take a look at what I've got. Um, so here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna get into the U.S. So this is the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield since 1790. And here's a really funky thing um, that I want to show you guys. And if you guys have been going over my technical analysis, um, this this chart exhibits exactly what I would be looking for. Uh, we were coming on down, and then look at this. We, we created this like cup and handle pattern almost where it, it led in, it came up, and then it, and then the lows were not as low, and then it broke. We have this big long-term downtrend line, and we broke, and we ran way up. And I'm just kind of thinking here that from 1790, it looks like we were declining in interest rates the entire time. We broke out from an energy crisis in 1970, peak oil all this stuff, high inflation. We had big demographics, baby boomers coming into home buying years. We had an expansion phase of real estate. And we, we basically had this move higher from 1946 all the way to 1980. The 10 year went all the way up. And I wanna, I've want to. i got some other charts here in the housing starts of basically 1940s all the way to 1980. And I'll show you some cool correlations. And then we had this decline. And, it, and I don't, maybe I'm just throwing something out here. It, it, this could be a, almost like a double bottom. And this only goes to 2017. I know it's, it's down here still. But is this kind of like a breakout and then a, a huge back test? And then we, we, we really surge in the future? I don't know. I, not, not exactly sure. I just wanted to show you that we did break this downtrend line in, in the 1970s and it just ran. Now looking at this from a 5,000 year, mix. Uh, so back in the 1720s uh, and, and before, it looked like rates were really high. They went down in the 1700s. They came up in the late 1700s and then back down. For all, about 100 years, it was declining. Then we, we start cycling more. Uh, I'd say about 1900 to early 1900s, long-term rates went up. We came back down uh, to the 1940s. And then we rolled higher all the way to 1980. And then we came back down. And we're almost, <clears throat> we're almost uh, sitting here consolidating before probably a move higher. But it seems like the, the moves are getting bigger and bigger. And maybe we could draw a line going through here where the next move could be all the way up into the 20-something percent range. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's tough to say what the future is, but I, I do think it's getting more volatile. Now, looking at... This is in the early 20th century. Inflation was associated with wars. At least that's what they they think. 
And what I did is I took a little bit different approach. Uh, I took, this isn't the inflation rate. And over here, I, I kind of, I don't know, this seems more doctored up versus the, this is kind of the raw movements. And then it seems like we try to control everything here. But this is the consumer price index. And I know that the index is all manipulated on this right-hand side. And that's why it's all tight and controlled. But this is the consumer price index all the way back to 1914. This is the annual U.S. housing starts from 1890 to 2015. So it's pretty close, the data. So when you're looking at this data, uh, you can see like the 1890, it's pretty flat and pretty steady. Uh, and then in 1914, uh, we see this inflation kick up. I think that what, what kicks it up is this guy here. Remember, housing starts leads inflation. So it kicks up, it stays elevated, and we saw this elevated inflation here from, I don't know the exact timing here, but 1914-ish, uh, we, we were low. I don't know the exact timing of this here, but we, we kicked up the housing starts. And I think this is the inflation from it. We dove back down uh, before 1920. That's what this, this dive down here is, I think. Then we came back up higher in the, in the 1920s. This was the 1920 boom uh, here. We started to decline, and it really fell out in 1920, late 1920s, and that was the 1929 crash. That's the crash right in here, the Great Depression. Uh, so you could say that the housing starts led the Great Depression, and we had a housing real estate market collapse in the 1920s. 1930s right here, it already was collapsing. Uh, this was the bottom, so 34, the real estate market came up again, uh, coming us breaking us out of the Great Depression, uh, coming back up, it, it dove back down again. <laughs> and right, I would say before 1950, for sure, we got this nice move higher, we got a nice move higher here. And this whole area in here remained elevated. We had a big boom, like a demographic boom that must have came back from World War II and they just procreated like heck and were building homes, apparently. So we had a bunch of, of, of people uh, procreating, they had more spending, we had more uh, home building. And we had a higher, kind of in this entire period here, after I'd say 1950, uh, here's 54. So this time frame here was all inflationary. Notice how we didn't really dip below the line again. And I think people weren't dying is what was going on. People were dying back here and we didn't need as many homes. So we could we saw the home builds really kick up here, and it remained elevated, and some of these were massive, like this boom in the early 1970s and the boom again in the late 70s to 1980, and that was the higher rates of inflation. And I would suspect that it's all these people also coming into not just home buying years, but also having kids and going into spending habits that increased spending. We also had an energy crisis that started in 1970 as well. So all of this was basically piled on top of each other, uh, which created this large inflationary uh, period. Then after that, the demographics didn't support these higher prices. We solved the energy crisis. And all of those things together, I think we had a low inflationary period. You could see that the housing starts weren't as high. Uh, the, the gold to monetary base already accounted for all of the inflation in the system in 1980. So everything was kind of deflating or moving on back. We had our fictitious housing market bubble here driven by what I consider not really by demographics, but more so by uh, loans, a loan debacle, we'll call it. And that created a huge problem in 2009. And you can see the, the price inflation uh, go into deflation in 09 and then they started printing a bunch of money to try to bring it back up um and now we're coming back up and today we're going back into an expansionary phase above the 1500 mark uh and and the the, the problem of housing is so dire we're five and a half million homes short that we need to build we could build two million homes which is at the high points here for the next 10 years to catch back up uh, according to nar Lawrence, can't remember, Yoon, Lawrence Yoon. So he thinks that you could build 2 million homes for 10 years and we would 
just be catching the, the real estate market back up. And that would be the biggest boom of, of any of these time frames for the longest period of time as well. So it could be, it could be, it doesn't mean it will be, it could be the largest inflationary period uh, because of the real estate starts being that high for that long, if it pans out that way. And I don't know if it will. I've got some other things that I grabbed from an article. It says, taking into possible headwinds, it says, in summary, we can draw a few specific conclusions. The investor experience of the most recent 35 plus years since 1980 was relatively unique within a long span of history because of the magnitude and persistence of interest rate declines over that period. That is a great statement, and I completely agree with it. <clears throat> We're looking at interest rates that have been held really low. We've declined from 1980 all the way down the entire time. And it's even low right now at 2021 as they use QE and try to hold a lot of the stuff down. But everyone that's been basically alive and working, they've seen and experienced this decline in interest rates, and they think that is normal. What I'm proposing is it might not be normal. We may see interest rates move back up, which is going to be a completely different environment than what everyone else is used to. So I just think this is a great statement. And it says, based on historical data, this seems unlikely to continue for much longer. In fact, it appears that this downward trend in rates is likely to at least end and possibly be reversed in the future. I love that statement. I really do. And I, and I believe it to be true. If this historical interest rate tailwind subsides or potentially reverses into a headwind, asset classes that benefited previously from the downtrend in rates will at least have this advantage removed and could potentially face an interest rate disadvantage for some period of time. I 100% agree with this article. 100% um, agree with that, with all of these statements. And that's exactly what I am thinking is going to happen and what I am potentially investing for. <clears throat> says, all of this has somewhat negative tone. And it's important to note that the outlook is not negative at all for the investor willing to think outside of the box. Using longer-term mean reversion am among asset classes is important. Certain areas of emerging markets and commodities look historically undervalued. The recent trends that have left U.S. stocks and global bonds well above long-term averages have been me nearly mirrored in the negative form in many markets ranging from copper to natural gas to oil to Brazilian, Indian, Chinese, and Russian stock markets. The headlines in the former asset classes are optimistic and cheerfully hopeful. The news on emerging markets and commodities are scary and negative. The setup in such unloved assets therefore appears quite attractive to the patient long-term investor. Guys, that article is so right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I think that's exactly what's coming. Uh, I think that interest rates are going to go higher. It's going to become a headwind for U.S. stocks. I even like the areas that they chose. Emerging markets and commodities. Totally 100% agree. If the dollar gets gets killed, I think India is going to kill it. They have good demographics. They have a good market. And what I think is going to happen is that if the dollar drops, money's going to rotate it and go over there. <clears throat> That's where I think is a really good spot. I think Indian banks, I think, are a super low risk area uh, to be in. I think they're going to make a butt, a butt ton of money. Uh, the two that I like are IBN and HDB, that those are the two that I own um, for Indian banks. Because if they're expanding the money supply, if they're growing because their population's growing, if their businesses are growing, everything's growing, uh, I think they're going to do incredibly well if they have the energy to do it. <laughs> uh, if they have the energy to do it. Because if we have energy shortages, then I think everywhere in the world is going to get hit. Outside of energy companies uh, and precious metals, I think we'll go ballistic. That's what I think. Uh, now, the article that I was reading, it's up here on the right. It's right here. It's SvainCapital.com uh, Perspectives 2016. This was written in 2016. Negative interest rates is what they have. So if you guys want to uh, do some research and, and read the article that I was reading, that's the article uh, that it was. I wanted to, to get that up there. So. Um, 
I think that article was completely right. It's it's right to the T. I think they even guided people in the right direction. Uh, 2016 was the bottom of the commodity bull market, the, the absolute bottom. We are kind of in, we're still in the beginning stages because the ratios went so low during the shutdowns that I think I would consider it that was like the anthem before the move. And the move was already in progress structurally. So we're entering it at a great time. And there's a lot of runway left in valuations to the upside, massive runway left. So I think that kind of looking at all this stuff and, and where the expansion phase of real estate is and all that, it, this is absolutely insane, the setups that we have and the potential runway ahead of us in terms of valuation that could be moved from an undervalued state to an overvalued state that this is like a once in a lifetime setup in my opinion. And it's already underway. So it's, it's not a very high risk uh, proposition either. So if you guys like this, this analysis, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, and thank you for listening. This is Finding Value.